Today, the genie is out of the bottle. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to the latest post covering finance and property news with a distinctively Australian flavour. The ABS released their 2017-18 cycle of the Survey of Income and Household, SIH, collected information about income, wealth and housing from residents in private dwellings in Australia, excluding very remote areas. The SIH provides estimates of the distribution of income and wealth across the population, plus detailed information about housing and tenure. The 2017-18 SIH collected information from a sample of 14,060 households over a period of July 2017 to June 2018. Various other characteristics of households and residents like employment, industry and occupation, family makeup, disability status, education and childcare use give these key indicators a rich context to help understand the living standards and economic well-being of Australians. Now, in comparison to the DFA 52,000 rolling household survey, which gives roughly a 0.5% sample of all households, the ABS series is actually quite limited. But they say that the mean equivalised disposable household income, the EDHI, in 2017-18 was $1,062 per week. And after adjusting for the $1718 dollars, this has not significantly changed from 2015-16 at $1,046 a week. In fact, EDHI increased in real terms from 1995 to 96 to 2007 and 8, and a decline in average income followed the global financial crisis in 2008. An average income has since recovered and is now higher than before the GFC, but the growth recently has been very slow, which isn't surprising given flat income growth. In 2017-18, the main sources of household income were employment income, 61% of households, the same as in 2015-16, and government pensions and allowances, 23% of households. And that's a significant decrease from 2015-16 when it was 24%. In 2017-18, average household wealth or net worth was $1 million. After adjusting to $2017-18, average wealth has increased by 6% since 2015-16 in real terms. Wealth is the value of a household's assets minus the value of its liabilities or debts. In 2017-18, the mean value of household assets was $1.2 million, while the mean level of household debt was $183,900. Owner-occupied dwellings were the largest asset held by households, representing a value of $500,600 when average across all households, accounting for 42% of household assets. Superannuation funds were the second largest household asset overall and the largest financial asset averaging $213,700 per household across all households. Superannuation funds accounted for 18% of household assets. Just one in five households, or 22%, owned property other than the dwelling in which they lived, including residential and non-residential property for rent and holiday homes. And the value of property other than home averaged $180,400 across all households and accounted for 15% of total assets. In 2017-18, household debts were on average $183,900 an average equity, the difference between the value of the home and the remaining value of the loan in owner-occupied homes, was $398,000. For all households, the average amount owing on home loans was $102,600, while the amount outstanding on loans other than property averaged $62,900. For all households, the average study loan debt was $5,000 and the average credit card debt was $3,000. Now, of course, the problem with this analysis is that the averages mask differences between those with and without mortgages or property more generally. So this is of actually limited utility, despite the fact that the $1 million headline was everywhere last week. The distribution of income and wealth is much more relevant, and so to analyse the way that income and wealth are shared across households in Australia, households are ranked from lowest to highest income or wealth, and then divided into five equal groups, with 20% of the population in each group or quintiles. After taking into account the number and age of people in the household, households in the highest income quintile received 40% of total income in 2017-18. By comparison, households in the lowest income quintile 
receive just 8% of total income. This pattern has remained relatively stable over the past 22 years. The distribution of wealth is more unequal than the distribution of income. The wealthiest 20% of Australian households owned 63% of total household wealth in 2017-18. And by comparison, the lowest 20% of households owned less than 1% of all household wealth. And mean equivalised disposable household income in Australia was $1,062, as we said, but the median was lower at $899 per week. This is due to the larger proportion of households with middle or low income and the small proportion of very high income households. And there is greater inequality in the distribution of wealth than income. The lowest 20% of households in terms of net worth had a mean net worth of $35,200. And in comparison, the mean net worth of the wealthiest 20% of households was more than 93 times that of the lowest 20% of households at $3.2 million. The mean net worth of all households in Australia was $1 million, while the median was much lower at $558,900. Now, there are many summary indicators that can be used to help understand the distribution of income and wealth across the population. The ABS uses the Gini coefficient as an internationally comparable indicator. The Gini coefficient lies between zero and one. If everybody in the population had the same income or wealth, the Gini coefficient would be zero. Gini coefficient values that are closer to one represent greater inequality. And compared to other summary indicators, the Gini coefficient is not overly sensitive to low or negative incomes. And in 2017-18, the Gini coefficient for gross household income was 0.439. The Gini coefficient for wealth is typically higher than for income, reflecting greater inequality in the distribution of wealth. And the Gini coefficient for wealth in 2017-18 was 0.621. But if we turn to the World Bank database, we can get a relative read on the Gini metric, although they calculated the scores from 0 to 100, with the largest score showing, again, the most inequality. The international comparisons are interesting. The US had the highest score at 41.5, and inequality there has continued to rise, thanks to the rounds of QE and low interest rates, which have helped the rich to become even richer. China has scored... 38.6, which actually has slipped a bit, reflecting the wealth accumulation which has resulted from their booming economy. Back in 2009, China was above the US and was the most unequal society. Australia comes out next with a score of 35.8, which is significantly above Canada at around 34 and the UK at around 33. But the more equal societies are in Europe and Scandinavia. Norway scored 27.5, Belgium 27.7, the Netherlands 28.2 and Sweden 29.2. These more equal societies are often those with higher tax rates and a more redistributive economic system and with higher levels of financial support and welfare for the disadvantaged. So my point is, Australia's economy is, in my view, becoming more like the USA with higher inequality wired into the system. And the fact is, if we do continue to cut interest rates and do QE, inequality will continue to rise because asset prices will be stoked higher. Just remember that much of our wealth is linked to our horribly high home prices. Perhaps no wonder then there is so much focus on not letting property prices adjust to more normal levels. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching, and I'll see you again next time.